My name is John Sagronis. I'm professor of statecraft and national security affairs here at IWP, and I'd like to welcome you. Um, it is really a pleasure for me. Every time I see him, I miss him terribly from the days of the White House um, when I have the opportunity to work with a great patriot, um, a scholar, um, a funny guy uh, who gives bear hugs every time he greets you, and he did it again today, uh, Juan Zarate. Uh, Juan is a national expert on the issues of terrorist financing and the financial wars that we engage in and how we use Treasury as a very assertive tool of statecraft. He comes out of Harvard where he was an undergrad and then he went to Harvard Law School. He served in the Treasury Department as an Assistant Secretary of Treasury. I met him when he was at the White House as Deputy National Security Advisor for Counterterrorism. He, uh, as a political appointee left, he's now a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington. You've probably seen him many a time on CBS as a national security consultant, expert, um, and someone who is worth paying attention to. Uh, he's a wonderful friend, and one is, it's, it's, I'm smiling because uh, you're here. It's been a while, and welcome. Privileged to be here a couple of years ago, John asked me to come lecture. Uh, to his course, uh, talking a, a little bit more about the counterterrorism issues uh, of the day. And uh, certainly there are many challenges that we could talk about with respect to counterterrorism. I'm happy to field any questions there. But what I thought we could talk about is the subject of my book and, frankly, subject of a lot of discussion uh, today if you look at the papers, which is the centrality of the use of financial power and influence in national security. And frankly, the evolution of not just the thinking of the use of that power, but the the evolution of the very tools themselves. And so what I thought I would do with you today is talk a bit about that evolution, talk about why it has become so important to our national security dialogue, um, and how that's playing out in current events today. And again, you need not go very far in the paper, you can look at the front pages to understand how this is playing out. The very discussions about how to impose costs on Russia um, how to respond to the annexation of Crimea, potential further provocations in Ukraine, center around not the you know, placement of kinetic forces or troops uh, into theater, although that's part of the discussion as an element of deterrent. Uh, little discussion over how diplomacy can work, although we're trying. Really the sense that it's in the economic realm that we have the greatest capability to actually impose costs and perhaps deter, if not to change behavior. If you look at the Iranian discussions and the nuclear uh, diplomacy underway, the question of how financial measures have brought President Rouhani and the Iranian leadership to the table have actually been subject of much analytic discussion. But now the question of how to use those economic tools to ensure that a nuclear deal can be trusted and how to unwind some of these pressures that have so isolated the Iranian economy are now coming to the fore. If you look at the question of how you deal with a metastasized Al-Qaeda terrorist movement with the black flag of Al-Qaeda flying over various regions around the world, the question of how you use these tools of, to attack terrorist financing and to undermine Al-Qaeda's ability to raise and move money around the world are now prominent. You listen to the Treasury officials talking about those challenges. And so you can go from the high order issues of nuclear diplomacy to the very tactical questions of terrorism and organized crime, and a common dimension among them is how you use financial tools, and frankly the evolved tools of the isolation of rogue actors from the financial commercial system to the benefit of American national security. And one need only as well look to how our enemies, or those that have been targeted by these tools, have responded or how they have felt in, in reaction over the past 10 to 12 years. And they've noticed that something is very different. In fact, one of the questions posed to me when I started writing the book and decided to publish it was, aren't you worried that you're going to be revealing too much in terms of American strategy and thinking about these issues? The answer was actually fairly simple, which is those who are most affected by it actually understand better, frankly, than folks in Washington what has been at play and what they've lost and how they've been affected. And so if you li listen to the words of Bin Laden himself, 
contained in the memos found in the Abbottabad raids, uh, you find that he was bemoaning the fact that Al-Qaeda could no longer raise and move money the way that it once did. In fact, he was musing about how to develop new strategies like kidnap for ransom as a core dimension of strategy for Al-Qaeda core to raise money. He'd seen the impact of that for the Taliban and certainly the tens of millions of dollars raised by Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. So he began to muse what other options were there. If you listen to the North Koreans in 2005 and 2006 when they were struck most deeply by these new tools and this form of financial isolation, they told American negotiators at the time, perhaps in a moment of drunken openness, uh, that we had finally found a way to hurt them. And if you listen to the Iranians and watch their actions around the negotiating table, you understand that the Iranians themselves have felt the isolation of what I call the constriction campaign against Iran's banks and financial and commercial entities. So much so that the Iranian leadership has called this the hidden war, the most significant assault on the revolution since its founding in 1979. And interestingly, there was just an article by Jay Solomon in the Wall Street Journal the other day uh, pointing out and quoting Iranian leaders as well as merchants uh, offering advice to the Russians not to take lightly the threats of American financial power and economic isolation because they had underestimated the impact that it would have. And so the enemies and those that have been targeted understand that they've not only been hurt, but that they've been hurt by something different, something different that is different than the sanctions that have been imposed on a North Korea or an Iran or even terrorist organizations for years, if not decades. And I think you need to take a step back to understand why those tools are different and how that strategy evolved. Because financial warfare has always been a part of statecraft, bless you, and warfare. Um, frankly, you can look back, and those of you who are great students of, of history and of warfare understand that even dating back to the chronicles of the Peloponnesian War, that the fights over access to the trade routes around the city-state of Megara actually prompted uh, conflict between Athens and Sparta. It even uh, spawned the, the lexicon and the, the notion of the Megarian Decree, that is to say, uh, lack of access to a city-state uh, will be used as an element of power. And if you look at history over time, city-states and marauders uh, big countries, alliances, empires have always used access to trade, economic influence, and power as a means of statecraft, as a means of influence. But in the 21st century, that power has been wielded differently. And I want to explain a bit about that. Because in understanding the post-9-11 environment and how these tools were evolved, you can understand then more clearly what's at play today in terms of these financial engagements. In the first instance, in the post-9-11 environment, you had a realization that there had to be a use of all elements of national power to try to undermine uh, Al-Qaeda's abilities to attack the United States and the ability of terrorist networks to interact and to uh, be able to finance the grand imaginings of their leadership. And so in that sort of political uh, push and paradigm, you had the, the very notion of using treasury and financial tools in a much more aggressive way than we had in the past. There was no question that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s we had used economic sanctions and power in our diplomacy and in our statecraft. Um, but that was a, a mixed bag of success and not non-success. You had uh, the case of South Africa where economic isolation and trade sanctions actually affected some change. But you also had the cases of Cuba and even Iraq, where sanctions not only didn't change behavior, but in the case of Iraq, I would argue, actually ensconced and empowered the regime by allowing them to gain the system and to profit from the very regime that we had put in place internationally. And so there had been a reflection on the use of these powers over time and an evolution to the thinking of the use of targeted sanctions more aggressively to attack the finances of leaders and networks uh, in a way that would not necessarily damage the civilian population of a country, but would try to attack the finances of key leaders. And so in this post-9-11 environment, this evolution of thinking on targeted sanctions 
was in many ways put on steroids and amplified. And so in the first instance, you had a, a, an extreme focus on the use of financial intelligence as a key component of understanding our enemy and understanding the financial networks that were part of Al-Qaeda and their terrorist allies. Keep in mind that financial intelligence over time, dating back to the days of looking at organized crime and drug trafficking cartels, was always a part of how the law enforcement intelligence communities thought of looking at threats, but in many ways was often ancillary to the way that they uh, analyzed a problem or devised policy solutions. In the post-9-11 environment, very differently, you had financial intelligence take an equal seat at the table along with human intelligence and signals intelligence, uh, measures intelligence, MAZINT. So you had the formation of a very new doctrine known now as FINIT, financial intelligence, with the development of organizations within the U.S. government intelligence community, within law enforcement itself, and also within the Treasury Department uh, to create the intelligence capabilities to collect, analyze, and deploy that kind of information. Financial intelligence meaning everything from the pocket litter found uh, in a terrorist's pocket, if he's arrested somewhere, to the high order bank wire transfer between global banks uh, of suspect terrorist financiers. And so programs emerged, uh, elements of governments were born, uh, and a, an appreciation that financial intelligence not only gave us a, a better sense of the mosaic of our enemy and how they were operating, but also actionable information to be able to do something about it. So that was a key part of the environment that shifted. You also had new tools that emerged. As I described, there had been an evolution over the years of the use of targeted financial sanctions. But importantly, uh, President Bush signed an executive order on September 24, 2001, known as Executive Order 13224, uh, that expanded greatly the power of the U.S. Treasury and the State Department to use financial tools to isolate terrorist and rogue financial activity. Keep in mind that this was often described as the very first action taken post 9-11 by the U.S. government. Not the invasion of Afghanistan, not the launching of a TLAM, but the signing of an executive order that in essence set the ground rules and the cornerstone for the financial warfare campaign to come against Al-Qaeda. And what was important about that executive order and why I describe it as an amplification of what came before was that it broadened the financial target space and the tools that could be applied. That is to say, it wasn't just uh, Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda's leaders like bin Laden or Ayman al-Zawahiri who were subject to financial isolation. And by the way, were they really going to have bank accounts in New York anyway? Um, but it was about looking at the financial facilitation networks that supported and facilitated what those networks were doing. To include the banks. To include those entities owned and controlled by uh, those, uh, those financial elements and those individuals, to include those associated with them. And so suddenly with the signing of this executive order, which allowed the Secretary of the Treasury to list and designate individuals and entities and potentially even banks, you had the ability to isolate these actors from the U.S. financial system, to freeze any assets or transactions that were in the U.S. system or moving through the U.S. system, to make illegal doing business with U.S. persons or citizens, uh, and then to put, in essence, a financial uh, scarlet letter on those so designated, isolating them uh, from the U.S. financial system. So that began the campaign against terrorist financing, the use of targeted sanctions in a way to isolate and to unplug these actors from the system. You had other tools emerge. Title III of the Patriot Act. Patriot Act is often thought of as the intelligence uh, you know, bill that broke down the walls between law enforcement and, and intelligence uh, has all these sunset provisions which are controversial. But often ignored is Title III of the Patriot Act, which in many ways broadened and deepened the anti-money laundering system that had been in existence in the United States since the 1970s and 80s. And the anti-money laundering system, as many of you know, is built on the premise of transparency and accountability for financial transactions, trying to stop or deter suspect transactions moving through the financial system. And so the Miami Vice version of the world where drug traffickers take satchels of 
cash and deposit them in banks uh, were not, no longer supposed to happen because the banks were supposed to know their customer, know where money was coming from, know the beneficial owner of where wire transfers were going, uh, imposed limits on cash uh, transactions and reporting requirements on that and suspicious activity. And so that system had existed, but this was a broadening and deepening of that system, making clearer and more accountable the, the question of knowing your customer and of customer due diligence. And not just on banks, on other non-bank financial institutions. So money service businesses like the Western Unions of the world, the money grants, uh, the bodegas on the corner that send remittances to diaspora and family populations back home. Those are now subject to these rules and these systems. Uh, brokers and dealers in all sorts of things to include precious metals and stones. So those of you who like jewelry may have found that you had to suddenly provide more information to your jeweler as a part of transactions for fear that those transactions were fronts for money laundering. Insurance companies were now subject to this. So the, the set of actors regulated became uh, now central to the anti-money laundering system. To include non-traditional ways of moving money, the whole issue of Hawala or Hundi systems, the traditional ways of moving money through trusted brokers across borders in places like South Asia or the Gulf or in Africa, and even North America and Europe, now became subject of regulatory attention and some pressure. And so there were new tools, some amplified from the past, some new. And interestingly as well, there was a new tool provided by Congress uh, to the Secretary of the Treasury called Section 311, that's the section of the Patriot Act, that gave the Secretary another arrow in his quiver. That is to say, the ability to designate a known bank, a jurisdiction, a class of transaction as a primary money laundering concern. That is to say, this is a problematic institution or country, and they lack the controls that make the Secretary of the Treasury and the U.S. government satisfied that they can protect the integrity of the U.S. financial system. The bottom line there is another scarlet letter that could be put on an institution or a jurisdiction that could lock them out of the system. And the Secretary of the Treasury could actually say you can no longer have access to U.S. banks or institutions. And so tools began to emerge that gave broader and deeper authority and power to lock actors out of the U.S. financial system and at the end of the day out of the global financial system. The entire enforcement environment also shifted. So you have intelligence around the financial environment emerging, new tools uh, being born and, and amplified in many ways, and then these tools, this intelligence being used aggressively and being used in ways to hold banks accountable for anti-money laundering, delics and problems, uh, being used to identify known terrorist suspects, being used to identify corruption and problems in the system. Importantly, what this did was it sensitized the private sector to the reputational risks and, frankly, the bottom line business risks of being caught in the crosshairs of these regulatory measures. Keep in mind, at the time, you had a number of banks fall under investigation by both regulators and law enforcement authorities. Riggs Bank, which was once known, actually once called itself, the, the most important bank in the most important capital of the world, uh, was subject to a very fierce and intense anti-money laundering investigation. Uh, in fact, they were then fined for anti-money laundering problems, in part because they didn't have proper systems in place to report suspicious activity, in part because they dealt with Pinochet's assets and hadn't reported a lot of that and allowed a lot of things to go sort of under the covers and uh, without much supervision. They also ran all the embassy bank accounts in town, um, which created problems because they didn't ask hard questions of those depositing you know, large amounts of money into the accounts or transferring them elsewhere. And so they came under scrutiny for what they did or didn't do with the, the accounts of Equatorial Guinea, for example, or Saudi Arabia, which had transfers to some of the hijackers in San Diego. And so Riggs Bank came under intense pressure, was fined, and frankly not fined very much for purposes of a bank. In fact, frankly a rounding error for their purposes, about $25 million. But what was important here, and what was important about this new enforcement environment, was the weight 
and the reputational costs of what those uh, enforcement actions did. And within a year, Riggs Bank was no more. The once fabled branch which sat right across, right across from our windows at the Treasury Department, if you walk on Pennsylvania Avenue and look to the Treasury Department on the left with the statue of Secretary Gallatin there in front, you look to the right, for decades that was Riggs Bank, now no more. And it wasn't the amount of the fine, it was the effect of the reputational impact of not having had anti-money laundering controls in place. And so the enforcement environment was shifting. There was more attention to these issues and more risk to the private sector. There was also a new form of what I call financial diplomacy. And so you now had, with the use of all elements of national power, with the, the use of financial intelligence, with the use of these enforcement tools uh, aggressively, you had new actors at play in what had traditionally been classically national security issues. And so the question of how to deal with terrorism was now a central issue for finance ministries and central banks around the world. This was no longer just the province of the CIA or the FBI or even the State Department of the Pentagon. This was now the province of the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve. And interestingly, not just counterparts in government, but counterparts in the private sector. So that CEOs of banks and non-bank financial institutions now had to worry not just about being caught uh, doing something illegal or untoward, but actually thinking about themselves in terms of the system and as guardians at the gate of the financial system itself. And so these were new actors in the context of diplomacy, finance ministries, central banks, bank CEOs, compliance officers, general counsel's offices. That was now part of the discussion. And so all of this created a very different environment, an environment where financial issues were now central to the question of terrorism and, and the disruption of terrorist activity. But what was interesting about this was that the financial ecosystem itself began to change as a result, and change in some fundamental ways that were important to the environment, but also important strategically. And that's where I want to discuss how the strategy and the thinking actually shifted. Because the trade sanctions of the 70s, 80s, and 90s very much relied on classic, the classic McGarrian ability to isolate trading routes and exports and to try to hermetically seal countries from the rest of the world and provide outlets like the Oil for Food program with Iraq and other things. That was an outdated model in this environment because this new environment in the 21st century is one in which we're dealing with a globalized financial and interconnected commercial system. That is to say, financing in the 21st century is no longer uh, simply a matter of being isolated in one country or one uh, region of the world. It's an interconnected environment. And in that environment, you have uh, the realization that America's enemies, in order to have any real impact, the ability to actually threaten our national security interests in real terms, had to have access to those systems. They obviously need money. Right? That's an obvious uh, sort of uh, you know, throwaway uh, observation. Uh, Al-Qaeda needs money to attack. Al-Qaeda needs money to uh, create alliances. Al-Qaeda needs money to train for I get it. Drug trafficking networks make money, they try to use money to expand their influence to corrupt local governance. That's obvious. Organized crime, the same thing. North Korea and Iran to establish regime stability to do things like nuclear programs. That's obvious. But what makes this environment different is the fact that in order for these networks, be they non-state or state, be they rogue or quasi-legitimate, in order for them to have impact, they have to have access to the elements of the global financial and commercial system. They need banks, they need insurance, they need the ability to transport. And in many ways that became an illuminating part of a new way of thinking about the system and the environment. The environment was also impacted by this realization that reputation itself became the coin of the realm, not just in the financial community, but around the world. That no actor wanted to find themselves doing business with an illegitimate or illicit actor. And if they were going to test the enforcement authorities and try to make money as a result 
they were going to be not only putting at risk their, their freedom or a potential fine, but the actual integrity and solvency of their institution itself, like in the case of the bank. And so reputation itself became a commodity. And in that regard, the view of the private sector shifted as well. Because in many ways, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the private sector was always viewed as, in some ways, ancillary to these national security issues. But in this new ecosystem, this new interconnected global environment, the private sector is actually central to what happens around the world. The ability of these actors to gain access to the financial world or the commercial environment. That they really are the guardians at the gate of the system. And in many ways are now central protagonists and not simply ancillary, re ancillary regulated bodies in this system and environment. And so it allowed us, this environment, this new ecosystem, allowed us a different way of thinking about these tools. And the difference was that we thought about not just hermetically sealing countries from uh, commerce, but what we thought about was how to unplug or isolate rogue actors and illicit capital from the elements of the international financial commercial system. Not so much how could you hermetically seal a country, not so much whether or not you worry that an HP printer or Wrigley chewing gum appears on the streets of Tehran or Pyongyang. That's important in terms of trade sanctions. But more importantly, do the elements of those systems, of the North Korean banking system and commercial system that they rely upon, and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards access to banks, and Iranian banks access to capital from the West, do those have access to the implements of the global system? And can you unplug or isolate those? It's a very different way of thinking about the use of these tools, and in many ways does fundamental damage to the notion of classic sanctions, where classic sanctions are often thought of as either unilateral or multilateral, uh, and they're applied in concert with, a, with our diplomacy as part of a diplomatic strategy. This is different. This is different because it's about isolating rogue and illicit capital from the financial system with the goal of protecting the financial system from the illicit activity itself, from the underlying conduct that is so dangerous and risky, not just for businesses, but also for the system itself. And so therein lies a difference, a fundamental difference, because if you look at the system differently, if you look at the strategy differently, you're talking not just about the use of classic trade sanctions, you're talking about the isolation of actors from the implements of the global system that they need to project power. And so that's the strategy that began to evolve in 2001, 2002, 2003, in many ways born out of the campaign against terrorist financing and Al-Qaeda, but then very quickly evolving into something much bigger and grander in terms of a national strategy. Now let me give you an example of how this worked in practice, because this all sounds very interesting, but it doesn't quite compute if you don't see some of the, the examples at play. Understanding this environment and understanding what was happening and frankly understanding the tools that we had to bring to bear, we began something in 2003 called the Bad Bank Initiative, for lack of a better term, it's a very simple uh, name. Uh, we also had a, a Buddy Bank Initiative, which I won't explain, but people didn't like that name. Um, and the idea behind the Bad Bank Initiative was to look at the global landscape a bit differently. That is to say, where can we find and see those key financial ligaments, those key elements of the financial system that are not only just bad actors unto themselves, where you would want to find them or, or isolate them or ultimately see them shut down, but where are those actors that are actually uh, providing financial facilitation to America's most lethal or important enemies? Uh, and in doing that, we began to look at the world very. We began to look at the world very differently. Uh, and what you see in that regard is that certainly there are a number of financial institutions that that are at play. But you also begin to see dependencies and vulnerabilities among America's enemies. Because the orthodoxy for many years was that, with respect to North Korea, for example, there wasn't much else we could do to them. Right? We had sanctioned them to death. The Hermit Kingdom does no trade with the West. Uh, the leadership has no bank accounts in New York or San Francisco. And so what in the world can be done to North Korea 
to further isolate it or to hurt it economically or financially. The same with Iran. But the reality is if you look at this interconnected 21st century system and you look at the vulnerabilities and the needs of these regimes, they actually have fairly important and deep financial and commercial relationships. And so with North Korea, as we looked at the map, began to see emerge a number of interesting financial relationships with banks in China and Russia, Southeast Asia and Mongolia. Even a bank that they ran in Vienna called Golden Star Bank, which they used to not only deposit money, but also to sort of finance some of the trade in uh, booze and fancy European cars and other things that they like to import from Europe. And so we saw that there were vulnerabilities, that the Hermit Kingdom was not quite so isolated, and that elements of the North Korean intelligence establishment were actually charged with the ability to raise and move money on behalf of the regime, to make money by moving drugs around the world. Keep in mind uh, the Australian uh, capture of the Pong Su vessel by Australian Special Forces that had cocaine and heroin on it, which was emblematic of a lot of the trade that the North Koreans were engaged in. They continue to do this now with methamphetamines uh, and other uh, types of drugs in concert with some of the Asian triads. They've uh, smuggled and counterfeited cigarettes. And so you have the tobacco companies sort of chasing the North Koreans around the world and in Taiwan to try to get at the fake Marlboros and the fake uh, cigarettes that they, that they produce. They, of course, are master proliferators. It's a major source of income for the regime. Uh, keep in mind they were behind the Syrian nuclear program, uh, which was revealed by President Bush in his book, Decision Points. Uh, also uh, part of the missile trade with Iran, which is now uh, well chronicled by analysts and academics. And so they were masters at that. They're also masters, interestingly, from a Treasury perspective, at counterfeiting U.S. $100 bills. Actually the best in the world at, at it. The Secret Service calls it the supernote because it's so good. And I guarantee you that if I passed a supernote, which is a $100 bill around here, oh, you wouldn't put it in your pocket, but um, if I pass it around, you would not be able to tell the difference. Those that are able to tell the difference are the Secret Service specialists using their special techniques looking for particular flaws. And sometimes uh, currency exchangers or money handlers who can kind of sense and feel the difference. Actually, the very first supernote was found by a money exchanger in Manila who could feel the difference in the notes. And so the supernote has emerged in not just Manila, but in Taiwan, Yemen, Peru, even Las Vegas. And so this is a criminal state that not only needs access to bank accounts, that not only tries to engage in commercial activity, but frankly is a criminal state, often called by experts a mafia state. They act like it, especially with their relatives. Uh, and sometimes called jokingly the Soprano State because they actually like the Sopranos. They have the DVD sets. Um, and so what was interesting about that was not just the revelation of all this, and I think many people knew this, but the revelation of the vulnerabilities. Because the underlying conduct was illicit, outright. And it didn't matter what your view of the North Korean nuclear program was or six-party negotiations or diplomacy the underlying facts were still there. The North Koreans were engaged in illicit conduct. And frankly, a lot of money laundering to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. And so in looking at that tableau, we saw financial relationships that created these vulnerabilities to include a small bank in Macau uh, known as Banco Delta Asia, run by the casino magnate uh, Stanley Ho. And all of you know that Macau now dwarfs Las Vegas as the casino hub of the world. Um, and so this was a bank that was in essence serving as an all-purpose provider for the North Koreans. They were doing everything from accepting counterfeit and depositing it to allowing Office 39 to have accounts to wire money and transfers for proliferation deals. They were doing it all. And so kind of a prototypic bad bank. Bad bank because they weren't doing what they should as a bank unto itself, but also because they were providing North Korea access to the facilities that they needed. So for us, a prime target in this bad bank initiative. So for two years, we developed the evidence, the information around this, prepared a Section 311 action to label this bank as a primary money laundering concern, to lock it out of the US financial system. 
And after two years of interagency negotiation, those of you who study or have been a part of the interagency process know how torturous that this can become. Um, after concerns about uh, the intelligence equities at play, whether or not we would reveal too much about what we knew about North Korean finances, were allayed. After some of the law enforcement actions uh, came to fruition, uh, to include uh, two very interesting cases run by the Secret Service and the FBI around the counterfeiting rings that the North Koreans were involved in, one on the West Coast, another one on the East Coast called Royal Charm, the other one called Smoking Dragon. After the takedown, believe it or not, at a New Jersey wedding, in mafia style, of some of these actors. And after the diplomats were comfortable with where we stood in the six party talks, at that point led by Chris Hill, the decision was made to launch the 311 action. Now, this was important because this was, in some ways, a test case for the use of 311 in a high order diplomatic engagement. 311 had been used before against certain jurisdictions against certain banks with relatively lethal effect. Many of the banks that were so designated died a quick death um, or were taken over by local authorities or were uh, completely sort of defanged of their ability to do business internationally. Uh, but what we had here was the injection of these powers right into the heart of the nuclear negotiations uh, with North Korea. And the impact was dramatic. Now, the impact on the bank was fairly predictable. Uh, there was a run on the bank by the depositors the moment the regulation went out. Uh, there was a freezing of all of the North Korean accounts in the bank. Uh, again, not much, about $25 million, that number again. Uh, uh, the Macanese Monetary Authority took over management of the bank itself. Uh, banks doing business with Banco Delta Asia began to cut off those relationships. So all fairly predictable. That was an isolated pariah from the financial system. But what was more important was what happened beyond Macau and beyond Banco Delta Asia. Because what we had done in addition to, in, in many ways, indicting the bank for its illicit activity, was we were exposing and indicting the North Korean illicit activity that was underlying that action. And the world and the financial community in particular had to take notice and so, in jurisdiction after jurisdiction, and bank after bank, what the North Koreans found was that their accounts were being frozen, that they were being locked out of the institutions that they once traveled easily in and out of. Their operatives were now being asked uncomfortable questions. And slowly but surely, like ripples on a, in a pond that were sort of hit by, a, uh, by an obstruction, suddenly uh, North Korea was isolated in particular in Asia, but around the world. And initially, the North Koreans poo-pooed the action. And you see this over and over again with uh, countries or institutions that were hit with these kinds of measures. But they understood something was different. And it took them about three weeks to understand something was different. And they called the White House and the State Department for the first time in modern memory, at least, uh, to say, we have to talk, and we have a problem. And for about two years thereafter, they began and ended every conversation, especially around the six party talks, with, we want our money back. <laughs> and the price of re-entry to the six party talks was a resolution of the financial pressure and isolation. Now, it wasn't the money that they really wanted, although they made the $25 million sort of the, the issue to negotiate at the table. What they really wanted was their access back. They wanted all of this unwound. As I say in the book, they wanted the genie put back in the bottle, but it had been let out. This caused huge complications for our diplomats. And if you talk to Chris Hill, he'll say, look, part of the problem with these new tools and the way that this played out in Banco Delta Asia was there was no neat or easy way to unwind them the way that we would, for example, the classic trade sanctions by uh, the lifting of a, of, a, of a law or regulation or even a UN sanction. Keep in mind this was much more in line with an organic market-based isolation of rogue actors and activity. The 311 itself was simply a proposed domestic regulatory rule that applied to U.S. banks only. There was no UN action attached to it. There was no bilateral agreement with the Chinese. There was no multilateral <coughs> classically or otherwise dimension to it. But what you had was global effect because of the way the financial system works 
the primacy of the U.S. economy and financial system, and the credibility, frankly, of the U.S. Treasury and what it says and does. And so what you had was global impact on a target of a U.S. interest. Even the Chinese, by the way, didn't want to touch uh, the taint of North Korean capital. This caused great division, actually, and interestingly to watch division within Beijing, where the political and mili military leadership wanted to support and back the North Koreans. But the finance ministry and central bank and the Bank of China itself wanted nothing to do with the taint of that capital. So much so that we had to put ourselves in pretzel-like formation to get the money back to North Korea as part of the resolution. The, the, the Chinese didn't want to touch it. So what we had to do was uh, put the U.S. at the center of the return of the money. So the Macanese authorities took uh, ownership and expropriated the, the accounts, then transferred the accounts to the New York Fed. The New York Fed then transferred it to the Russian Central Bank. The Russian Central Bank then transferred it to the Far Eastern Bank, which still had some correspondent relations, but I believe Tanchon Bank in North Korea and transferred the money in. By the way, President Putin talked to President Bush to make sure that the Russian dimension of this, the entities, would not be targeted as a result. And so we had to unwind this, and frankly, the U.S. had to be centrally a part of it. What's interesting about that is not just the demonstration in North Korea of the power, but also the demonstration in Washington. For me, it was very interesting because I'd been at the Treasury for about four years working on these issues and had just arrived at the White House as the DNSA for counterterrorism. So I got to watch from a White House vantage point how the national security establishment understood and viewed the use of these powers. And in many ways, we in Washington were shocked at the impact. And in fact, if you talk to most of the experts at the time, including North Korea experts, and including those uh, expert in financial intelligence or uh, illicit capital, They'll say, we did not expect the strategic impact of what happened. General Hayden, the former NSA and CIA director, called this a 21st century precision guided financial missile, uh, given its impact. And so there was an awakening, awakening within the national security complex itself here in Washington that there was something different at play. That these were not the classic trade sanctions of old, that we actually had found a way of hurting uh, North Korea and gaining attention and leverage in that regard. Now there's much debate, and I get into this in the book, about whether or not the timing of the action was right, whether or not the way that it was deployed um, actually interfered with the diplomacy. Um, all of that, those are important questions, but there was no doubt that we gained leverage uh, in the discussions with North Korea. And we gave, we gave our diplomacy not only teeth, but also something to bargain with at the table as we've seen in the case of Iran. And so that paradigm, the paradigm that began to see the use of financial tools and influence as a way of isolating rogue capital and rogue actors, then became quite popular. It became the baseline then for how we thought about dealing with Iran. And so emerging then in 2005, 2006, on the heels of the BDA experience was the constriction campaign against Iran, starting first with the isolation of Iran's banks which were facilitating a whole host of illicit activities and conduct that are not just unacceptable because it relates to a nuclear program, but unacceptable because it involves the integrity of the financial system. Things like terrorist financing, things like money laundering, things like the use of front companies for proliferation purposes. And so quickly we began to devise a strategy to isolate Iranian banks like we had thought about with other uh, countries in another context, starting with Bank Sadra, which supported Hezbollah and was a primary conduit for terrorist support uh, to Iran's proxies. Banks Meli and Malat, which are important to its proliferation. Ultimately, even Bank Markazi, the central bank of Iran, which was being used as an outlet for all these isolated banks as a way of accessing the financial system. And it's that isolation which began then the core isolation of Iran, and frankly, what has become a very effective way of hurting the Iranian economy in a way that uh, has gotten the Iranian leadership's attention. And what was interesting in the Iranian context, for those of you interested, is that the financial isolation was then paralleled by isolation in the transport sector and in the insurance sector. 
And so if you look at the, uh, the evolving Security Council resolutions, as well as U.S. actions in this regard, coming from the Treasury and the State Department, you see an isolation not just of the Revolutionary Guard, which is gaining more prominence in the Iranian economy, controlling its oil sector and its telecoms industry, for example, but also then an expansion of the same kind of isolation in these other uh, global commercial sectors. So much so that you have now President Rouhani coming to the table and the very first thing that President Rouhani wants is not necessarily the lifting of the oil embargo, that they want that, but the plugging of their banks back into the international financial system. Because without that, they have an inability to finance short, medium, and long term the things that the regime needs to survive, whether it's for jobs for the youth bolts that they have, or to create the deep water ports that the Revolutionary Guard thinks that they need uh, to deploy their forces, or even to develop things like the South Pars oil field. Without the access to capital, it's harder, it's costlier, in some cases riskier, uh, to raise money and to, to move it for purposes of the regime. So that's why, in part, I think, uh, the Iranians have come to the table. And it's that strategy that has been deployed now in other contexts. And so you've seen, for example, President Obama uh, deploy the same strategies, the same set of tools against new forms of organized crime. Transnational organized crime now, two years ago, labeled a national security risk, with the president signing an executive order that looks an awful lot like the executive orders on terrorist financing and proliferation financing and the other broader sanctions uh, arenas that we've, we've focused on. And so these are tools that are now, and strategies that are now central to how we're thinking about these issues. But there are limitations, of course, uh, to this. And, and this is where I want to talk about where we are now. Because I think what's interesting now is not only the fact that we've revealed and demonstrated how we can use these powers effectively, demonstrating, frankly, to our competitors uh, and to our enemies that in an interconnected global financial system, the U.S. has predominance because of the power of its economy, the power and attractiveness of its capital markets, the importance of the dollar as the reserve currency around the world. All of that matters. But in, in an interconnected financial and global system, the U.S. has vulnerabilities as well. And so we've taught our, in many ways, our enemies and competitors that this is a, a new era of financial warfare. And in that regard, there are limitations and dangers. And I think we've just begun to scratch the surface of what this new era looks like and what the doctrines and strategies around them should be. And in many ways, we've had predominance in this space, given the power and importance of the American economy and the role of the dollar. But that predominance is not ours alone, and the use of these tools is not solely within American province. These are things that the Russians, the Chinese, even al-Qaeda or cyber terrorists or uh, provocateurs could uh, deploy and employ against us. And so we're in a period actually, I think, of reflection. Reflection on the limits of the use of these powers. We see the limits in some ways in our diplomacy. As I said, these are very different powers than the trade and diplomatic sanctions of old. And so if we deploy these measures to actually protect the international financial system. In furtherance of our national security, there may be a time when there's a divergence between our diplomatic goals and strategies and the goals of protecting the financial system. We saw that in the case of Banco Delta Asia, where the uh, fight between the State Department and Treasury was a manifestation of this very divide between our diplomacy and financial strategies. We may see that yet again in the context of Iran where the drive is to come to a nuclear deal and solution and to lift sanctions. But what does lifting sanctions mean? What does it mean when the core element of what has been so harmful to the Iranian economy has been their isolation because of their underlying illicit conduct? What does that mean in terms of the role of the United States to unwind the financial pressure? That's still at play and may be a, a moment of reflection and limitation of the use of these powers. We've seen that in the context of Russia, where the very fears of the boomerang effects of an aggressive campaign to isolate Russia as a target of these kinds of tools, to turn Russia instead of a partner into a target of these financial isolation measures, could bring 
uh, negative externalities, if not a direct response from the Russians. And I'm not talking about the tit for tat, you name one official, we'll name Secretary McCain, uh, Senator McCain. You know, that, that's interesting, and interesting from a political and diplomatic perspective. But I'm talking about what could ultimately be low-grade financial warfare, where the West attempts to isolate Russia and impose real costs on its institutions, its banks, its companies, its oligarchs, where Russia then begins a campaign of harassment, expropriation, and potentially even cyber disruption in response. And so, in an interconnected global financial and commercial system, there are many actors at play and vulnerabilities on all sides. And in this case, the Russian bear can bite back, not just with its energy resources, but with its ability to affect Europe's economy and America's economy and interests. And so there are limitations there. There are limitations in the context of terrorism, where you have a metastasized al-Qaeda movement, which is no longer simply driven by a core hierarchy of al-Qaeda members from the 1990s and early 2000s, but a group that's metastasized into local insurgencies and local groups, groups like al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb that use smuggling and kidnap for ransom to raise millions of dollars, Boko Haram, which pretends to fly the flag of al-Qaeda uh, for its local uh, strategies and atrocities, uh, groups like al-Shabaab, which use trade-based money laundering, the export of charcoal, the import of sugar, local taxes, uh, extortion, and other means to raise money. Groups like al-Qaeda in Iraq, now known as ISIS, uses bank robberies and local criminality to raise money locally. How do these tools then apply to a metastasized, globalized, and localized terrorist network uh, if these are tools that apply best in the global financial system? There are limitations. And finally, how do we deal with the advent of new technologies? Things like digital currency, Bitcoin, Linden dollars, uh, the Liberty Reserve currency that was exposed uh, that allowed for about six billion dollars worth of money laundering and illicit activity. What is to be done with currencies and technologies that are built around the very notion of anonymity when the very notion of the anti-money laundering system is on knowing your customer and on identifying sources of funds and beneficiaries of transactions. And so what is to be done with those virtual currencies? And finally, in a multipolar world of challenges to American power, what does the challenge to American economic predominance and power look like? What is, what is the challenge to the globalized American economic system uh, become? What do challenges from the BRICS, for example, to the role of the, the dollar as the chief reserve currency? What does that look like in the context of this new environment? And so there are challenges to America's power in this environment. And so there are limits to how far the United States can go, uh, but also opportunities to continue to develop strategies and implement them effectively in this regard. And I've, for perhaps in the Q&A uh, session, I'm happy to answer this, but I, I've argued that there are ways of using these tools aggressively in the context of Russia without necessarily exposing ourselves to some of the vulnerabilities and some of the boomerang effects uh, that may be at play. But at the end of the day, we have entered, I think, a new era of financial warfare, one that was born out of the tools and strategies and political impetus to go after terrorist financing and al-Qaeda, but that spawned a new paradigm of power, the use of financial power that's now central to our discourse in the national security context. One that is a power unto itself, but also a complement to other powers. Financial intelligence is a part of intelligence work. Intelligence and financial investigations is part of enforcement efforts around the world. Elements that give teeth to our diplomacy, and even in the military context, a new doctrine known as threat finance, which is the ability to understand where our enemies are getting resources to be able to shoot at our men and women in uniform. So these are tools and strategies that not only are power unto themselves, but a complement to other power. Interestingly, and I'll end with this, is the evolution of Treasury itself uh, in this regard. And I share this with you because this is an audience that obviously understands Washington and perhaps likes uh, bureaucracy, or at least the study of it. Uh, some Weberians, I hope, in the audience. Um, but what was interesting to me was the evolution of not just 
these powers and strategies, but the evolution of treasury itself. And so the reason I wrote the book Treasury's War was because I wanted to tell the story of the evolution of these strategies. But I also wanted to tell the evolution of the institution itself at Treasury. Because when I was at Treasury, especially in the 2002-2003 period, I would go to the White House on behalf of the Treasury in the national security context. And people would raise their hand and literally ask, why is Treasury here? Treasury does not belong here anymore. Because the Treasury Department had lost the bulk of its guns and badges, the fabled agencies that had been part of the Treasury since the founding of the Republic, the Customs Service, the Secret Service, created by Abraham Lincoln to go after the Civil War counterfeit rings, uh, the ATF, uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. And so the, the elements of the Treasury Department that gave its stature and weight and funding were no longer there. They were gone to Homeland Security or to the Department of Justice. So the question was, what is Treasury? Why is it here? Does it have anything to contribute? And I think we answered that question quite clearly and resoundingly. We have unique tools and information and authority that actually have nothing to do with guns and badges, but have to do with the 21st century environment, where we can reach far beyond our borders using our economic power and might. And so what was very satisfying for me, and I think for John as well, at the end of our tenure at the White House in 2009, the question was the exact opposite. I would sit in the Situation Room or in the Oval Office listening to the President of the Cabinet, and they would ask the question, not why is Treasury here, but why isn't Treasury here? And what does Treasury have to bring to bear on some of the hardest and most important issues facing the country? And so that's why I wrote Treasury's War. That's why I think these issues are important. And for all of you who are involved in scholarship, in some way on national security, I would commend to you the very issues at play in the book because I think we are just at the start, not just of the use of these tools in our national security, but in many ways in the scholarship of how we think about these tools and this power in an interconnected and global world. So with that, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Three questions? Yes, sir. If you could indulge me for just a moment to bring a moment of historical perspective in a monetary context. By the way, I'm a retired customs agent, and I see you mentioned Richard Newcomb, former OFAC director yeah. in your book, and had the privilege of bringing him to Miami for a Cuban embargo prosecution many years ago. But, uh, you mentioned bad banks, and uh, from a former customs agent perspective, I'm troubled by Eric Holder saying that there are some financial institutions that are just too big to prosecute nowadays. Um, historically speaking, uh, founder Roger Sherman, um, who's primarily responsible for the monetary provisions of the Constitution, uh, was troubled by each colony having its own paper system of credit, and Rhode Island inflated theirs much more than anyone else, and he realized as a businessman if he dealt in Rhode Island currency, his wealth was actually being stolen, unless he reinvested it successfully very quickly. And in a sense, it seems like now that we have a purely a system of credit rather than actual money, um, aren't we almost Rhode Island to the rest of the world? Uh, in terms of, uh, we have an irredeemable IOU, or actually redeemable, only in uh, OPEC oil, to the extent we enforce that militarily and maintain the illusion that oil is inherently limited, when you know, many Russian and Ukrainian scientists would argue that oil is not a fossil fuel, it's abiotic. It's, it's actually probably tragic to try to base a system of credit on something that isn't fundamentally limited as gold or silver. Uh, Andrew Jackson shut down the second bank of the US because he argued that we were meant to have a circulating money of gold and silver coin to protect the wealth of the laboring class from being inflated away. And what are the consequences of, to us having gone so far down that path of inflation? I just, very briefly, the Kennedy half dollar, the 1964 half dollar, 90% silver, is worth $8 in current money. The, the ones that have been coined ever since we arguably became the rogue nation of the world by abandoning the Bretton Woods Agreement, it now has eight cents in current money of copper in, uh, clad with nickel. So the wealth of the laboring class has been inflated away. And might we not move towards a new Bretton Woods Agreement and restore, isn't Treasury's real function to maintain an honest unit of account 
rather than to be uh, the instrument of a weaponized system of credit. You, you raise a ton of issues. <laughs> first, 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 first comment, I'm not an oil and gas technical expert, so I can't speak to, to, uh, to some of that. But um, let me try to address a couple things. First of all, in reference to customs and, and to bad banks, um, customs had some of the greatest uh, anti-money laundering investigators and investigations historically in, in U.S. history. Uh, BCCI was largely driven and, and uh, shut down as a result of uh, customs service. Uh, and some of the most significant anti-money laundering investigations in, in the U.S. and places like Mexico have been customs uh, related. That's in part why there was such angst when customs left the Treasury Department. Who, who's going to worry about the integrity of the financial system that has done some badges? Now, Treasury still has the IRS criminal investigators, which, by the way, we leveraged to go after Saddam Hussein's assets. So if you read in the book, you'll see we had IRS jump teams going to places like Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. Uh, you may ask, what, what are IRS agents doing? Um, they were trying to retrieve money that, so that we didn't have to expend that money in Iraq, but also uh, it's the resources the Treasury had to bring to bear. Yeah. But in any event, that's one thing I wanted to mention because customs have been uh, very important in this regard. And I think a key question moving forward with customs and Homeland Security is what, what becomes of that ability to police the system, uh, which touches a bit on your point of, about what Eric Holder has mentioned. And I think we are in a bit of a conundrum because there are um, questions about systemic risk um, if certain banks, uh, as we saw during the financial crisis, were to collapse. And I think the same question arises, and you've seen it uh, arise openly with the Attorney General's remarks and, and others from the Department of Justice, as to whether or not you criminally prosecute a bank and, frankly, uh, don't allow it access to the U.S. financial system. Do you fundamentally do damage not only to that bank, but to the banking system itself? Um, and frankly, to the ability of the U.S. to serve as uh, a chief repository of, of international capital. Hank Paulson would call this the magnificent glass house. And so there, there are constant questions, and this goes to your final sort of comment and question, the real questions as to how the Treasury Department, how the U.S. government actually tends to the financial system itself. Because the Bretton Woods order was, in essence, a compact internationally where the U.S., along with other institutions like the IMF and World Bank would not only help establish the norms and, and, and uh, principles around the international monetary system, but that there would be a shepherding of that system, a, a guardianship, if you will, a trusteeship uh, over it, which the Treasury Department, I think, has taken very seriously over time. But I do think there is a question post-2008 as to whether or not uh, we've entered a period of systemic risk uh, that is um, that has forced us to rethink not just the, the existing systems, but the role of major banks in that system and how we can then impact them or, or otherwise not. Um, and I think that goes for uh, the economic uh, and, and AML realm as well. The final point I would make um, is that one of the limitations that I didn't mention in sort of my summation at the end is whether or not we've reached a limit of what we ask of the private sector in this regard. Uh, because if you, if you ask the private sector, they'll say, look, we've been asked to become the frontline uh, policemen for the system in many ways in this new order. Uh, banks are establishing financial intelligence units internally to not only be able to understand their customers, but to be able to predict risk coming down the road. And in many ways, the regulatory environment has become intolerant to even uh, the slightest sort of... Um, sanctions violation or anti-money money laundering delic. So there's a question as to whether or not we've used these powers too much and we've gone too far, frankly. So much so that you start to make the United States an unattractive place to do business. You, you begin to push legitimate actors out of legitimate banking activities. For example, banking money service businesses for Somali uh, diaspora communities. Uh, there's a case in the UK now uh, where the courts have stepped in not allowing Barclays Bank to uh, exit that particular type of business because there is no other bank that is willing to bank with that sector because of the risk. And so it's a different dimension of your question, but it's an important one because the question is how far can you take the use of these powers which rely on the private sector, but that also puts the private sector squarely in the crosshairs for that enforcement environment. 
And so I, th I think you've asked a very intelligent and important question. I just don't, I'm not sure we have an answer yet from a policy perspective as to how you balance the score in terms of understanding that we have to preserve our ability to be that capital haven while also preserving the integrity of the system and using our tools to do that. If I could just make one brief follow-up question. Uh, wasn't the national security in a sense more stable when the wealth in terms of gold was circulating around the country? And since 1934 when Franklin Roosevelt made it illegal for a time for Americans to possess more than a very small amount of gold, uh, Americans were compelled to surrender 8,000 tons of gold. Uh, who, who, does that, uh, who owns that now? Because the people were given as a Treasury official, I expect you to know that people were given notes that would one day be redeemable for that gold, but uh, whose is it now, and where is it? Well, there, there's gold in uh, repositories in the U.S. government, right? The U.S. Treasury uh, holds some of it. Um, some of it's housed at the Fed. There's plenty of that. Also, housing gold on behalf of other governments. Um, but I think your, your fundamental question is about the, the integrity of the U.S. currency. And, and the f full faith and confidence in that currency and the U.S. economy. And, and that, I think, relates not just to who holds gold or, or what backs the currency. That's critical. But also faith and confidence in the political system. Uh, question as to how much debt the country can, can uh, legitimately hold. And ultimately, what the role of the American capital markets are to sustain what is debt-driven uh, government spending. So I think it's a whole host of those issues that are fundamental to where are we going in a post-2008 context, uh, in addition to all of the challenges to, to those sort of central dimensions of our power, whether it's the renminbi being used more often in trade relations or virtual currencies emerging as a way of bartering and, and uh, exchanging uh, value. So I, I think you raise very good points, but I think it's part of a broader question, set of questions as to are we preserving the very sort of fundamentals of American uh, economic strength and power and the faith and confidence in the system that not only backs the currency, but back, backs the very financial system that's so important uh, to the U.S. Uh, in the back there, sir. Thank you uh, for your comments. Very, very insightful and good as well. Um, just by way of background, I appreciate the comments that you made just a moment ago about the idea that we might be potentially overusing some of these methods and putting an extra notice on our private sector. Um, I work uh, basically helping banks build the teams that you mentioned, financial intelligence units, and I've seen that firsthand. One of the things that I've also seen is that when sanctions are levied against banks, oftentimes they come back and they, uh, or penalties rather, they come back and they do the exact same actions because, like you mentioned earlier, $25 million to a bank, for example, Wiggs Bank, isn't really all that much. It's just a, you know, a figure on the balance sheet that doesn't really mean much at all. Reputationally, you can't, there can be a risk. We talk about banks like HSBC that continually are infracting and you know, creating problems against this system. Is it worth the idea of actually considering penalizing and maybe even removing people from employment for actions of the bank? So taking them out uh, major executives of banks, major uh, heads of divisions that are responsible for these problems. I know it's discussed, but if you think it's going to actually happen in the near future. It's a great question because it goes back to the question, how, how do you hold institutions accountable? And let, let me, in full disclosure, say, and this is on my bio, I, I'm an advisor now to HSBC after their money laundering problem. So I was brought in to help fix problems. Um, and I sit on a committee of their board, so full disclosure. Um, but I, I think you're right. I think there is a fundamental question of not only how do we hold institutions accountable, but, but actually individuals. That's a very delicate balance because I think uh, the last thing you want to do is create a system where compliance officers, for example, some of the folks you work with, um, are worried that each and every step they take is going to be second-guessed and deemed to be criminal, when in fact the, the very essence of the anti-money laundering system is to, to be based on a risk-based system. It's not to eliminate all risk. It's not to suggest that you're, not, you're, you're going to be able to hermetically seal the system from any illicit dollar or yen or pound that goes through the system. It's that you're going to have an ability to assess the risk and you're taking appropriate measures to deal with it, whether it's high risk or medium risk or low risk. And that was part of the problem with rigs, right? There was an inability of, of any system at all to deal with any of the risks attended to the business they were doing. So I think, I, I, I do think, especially in the post-2008 uh, context, there has to be accountability for, for what's done. 
Uh, and I've been, I've been actually shocked that there hasn't been more sort of individual prosecutions in light of the 2008 crisis. In the AML context, I think we, it's, a, it's a more delicate balance because you do have to hold institutions to account. And I think what holds them most to account is the threat and the sort of Damocles over the head that they can no longer do business in the United States. I mean, that's really, that was what was at play in the 311 context that I was describing. More often than not, the threat of 311 itself prompted action. Because any institution that wants to do business globally, that wants to be viewed as legitimate, has to have access to the U.S. financial system. And so putting that at risk is really what uh, moves mountains, I think, in terms of uh, cultural shifts, um, shifts of, of resources. It's not going to be the number of digits behind the, the decimal point. It's going to be the reputational impact and the real risk of losing access to the U.S. financial system. Uh, and I do think there has to be some degree of individual uh, accountability. But I, I think there's a delicate balance there. Yes, sir. I know, uh, glancing through your book here, you mentioned that the U.S. The oh, I hope you read the whole thing. I do, but I only have five there's, minutes. There's pictures in the middle, so that gives you a quick summary. Of yeah. <laughs> I only have five minutes to glance through the, the, the coming challenges that you forecast. Noticing the, the, the systemic challenges to the dollar, baskets of currencies, IMF special drawing rights. Um, my, my question is, is there really any system or conglomerate that is viable enough to replace the dollar in today's world, or even in the next 10 years? Not singly. I think, I think that's right, and I think it's been uh, sort of demonstrated the last couple of years that, that the dollar still retains not only its strength, but its attractiveness uh, as, a, again, not just a trading and reserve currency, but as a, a currency of last resort in order to, to hold value. I mean, most of the most of the U.S. currency uh, is actually held outside of the of the U.S. Uh, and in fact, whenever the U.S. Treasury puts out a new note, like the new hundred dollar bills they're putting out with all the security features, they usually have to devise uh, an advertisement campaign in foreign countries like Russia, where U.S. cash is held as a, basically a security uh, to to uh, to secure value, and so. Uh, you're right that the dollar is still predominant. The dollar still projects faith and confidence. I think, frankly, it's been helped by the crises around the world. Um, it's been helped in the context of the euro. You, you all know that the challenges there in the context of, of, of the common uh, euro currency. It's also been helped by the fact that China has certain institutional uh, you know, problems uh, that, if not fixed, won't allow the renminbi to truly become a global currency. It is now in the context of particular trading relationships. And it's beginning to be traded more and more. Uh, but in terms of actual volume and centrality of the, of the use of the renminbi, uh, that depends on rule of law, transparency, uh, other fundamental principles that the Chinese just have not engaged in in terms of reforms. Um, you see other currencies like the Swiss franc um, being resorted to as an alternative currency as well. I mean, the, the Swiss have actually had to take interventionist measures because there has been so much interest in the Swiss franc because there's a sense that no other currency really out there other than the dollar can, can preserve a value. And so you're right that there isn't sort of a, a singular challenger, but I do think the trend is toward trying to find alternatives, in part for ease of transactions, in part to uh, dislodge uh, some of these countries and transactions from dependence on the dollar. Um, and I think you've heard this from the Chinese and the Russians and the BRICs themselves, and I mentioned this in the book, where they want to accelerate the de-Americanization de of the global economy. And that is clearly part of the strategy. And so despite the current state of affairs, I don't think you should or we should be Pollyannish about where the trends may go and where they may be led by other actors in the system. And then follow up, sir. All right, go ahead. Talk Since you skim the book, could, could you talk a little bit about this pervasive narrative of Chinese hold, China holding U.S. debt and possibility of dumping it, and the massive run that would or would not incur on the U.S. economy? Is there any truth to that? What are the actual dynamics of that relationship? Well, if you read uh, my book, you'll see that I lay out an anecdote um, in which the Russians, uh, according to a story told to uh, Hank Paulson, approached the Chinese with that very uh, proposition in terms of mortgage-backed securities, not all debt holdings, but with respect to Fannie and Freddie in particular. 
and the idea was to dump in mass at the same time uh, uh, Chinese and Russian holdings as a way of, at the height of the financial crisis, the summer of 08, uh, to really undercut the faith and confidence in the U.S. system and the capital markets. Uh, the Chinese refused. Uh, we found out after the fact. Uh, but part of the reason the Chinese refused is that they have so much invested in the value of the American dollar. Many of the scholars who look at this closely call this the dollar trap. Right? And there's actually a, a very important question as to whether or not deep, deeper economic entanglement on both sides actually provides uh, a necessary shield and deterrent to the use of the most aggressive forms of economic warfare. Or you can imagine countries wanting to undermine faith and confidence in each other's systems as a way of furthering financial warfare, uh, but not being willing to do that because they are interconnected in the system in the case of China, dependent on American markets to not only buy their goods, but also to maintain the value of their investments. And so I, I think it's theoretically possible, uh, but I think the Chinese understand just as much as we do that there are essential elements to a stable system that are important for their bottom line as well. It's why, by the way, the Chinese and the Russians were first to uh, ban in some form or fashion the use of Bitcoin as a virtual currency. They understand the risks to their own currencies and their own systems as a result of some of these new developments. Thank you. <laughs>